every Monday to Friday. This is Peter Lewis's Money Talk. Money Talk. Good morning. Here we go with a brand new week. This is Peter Lewis welcoming you to Money Talk for Monday, the 8th of January, 2024. In today's business and finance headlines, Chinese shadow banking giant Zhongxi Enterprise Group has filed for bankruptcy in one of China's biggest ever corporate failures. A Beijing court on Friday accepted the investment group's application for bankruptcy and liquidation, and the court said that ZEG's assets are insufficient to pay off all debts, and it clearly lacks the ability to repay in full. China is launching an anti-dumping investigation into liquor products like brandy from the European Union, escalating a trade spat between Beijing and Brussels. The move comes after the bloc opened a probe last autumn into China's electric vehicle subsidies. Officials at China's Commerce Ministry said its anti-dumping probe into brandy imported from the European Union followed complaints from the domestic brandy industry. I'm joined now by Andy Sher, who is a Shanghai-based independent economist. Morning, Andy, and Happy New Year. Good morning, Peter. Happy New Year, too. Uh, let me ask you, first of all, about the, the news over the weekend, the failure bankruptcy of Zhongzhi um, Enterprise Group, which is at the, the heart of the, the shadow banking system. A lot of individual investors, mainly rich ones, of course, are, are going to lose a lot of money there. Um, why is Beijing prepared to let this company fail? Uh, well, I, I think that it's, uh, uh, it's a shadow bank. Uh, I, 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 and it's involved, it involves uh, 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 individual uh, indi- uh, money from individuals. And uh, I, I don't think the government would ever pay out or something like that. Mm. So I think the, the shadow banking system, uh, the banking regulator said at the beginning of the last year, 29 trillion high risk, basically uh, toxic. So I assume all their money will be lost. So at least one of those. I think it's about a 3.2 trillion RMB. So it's it's a small it's a part of, a small part of uh, of the overall problem. Mm. But there are others, of course, aren't there as well in the shadow banking sector who presumably have the same problems. Does this have any sort of economic impact in terms of maybe impact on consumer sentiment and people's propensity to go out and, and spend? Is there any economic fallout from this? Well, China is uh, uh, you know, it's going in two different ways. One is that uh, the, man, uh, the blue-collar workers – uh, have uh, uh, a lot of bargaining power because of labor shortage. Uh, their salaries continue to rise. Mm. So I think uh, the basic consumption is still okay. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, like uh, the high, uh, uh, the uh, the wealthy people, they are losing money in the shadow banking system, of, uh, obviously, and the stock market is not doing well. Uh, the property market is going down. The, la- the land basically is not liquid anymore. Uh, so I, I think that the demand for uh, uh, luxury stuff, like uh, let's say Ferrari or <laughs> or like uh, uh, Hermes bags, uh, that 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 kind of thing is really deflating. Mm. I mean, the, the the trust industry in China is obviously a key alternative funding source for some of those weaker borrowers who can't get regular bank loans, such as developers, some local government financing um, vehicles. Um, does this have an impact on, on them if we start to see, you know, these particularly if these problems widen across the shadow banking sector in China? Well, the shadow banking system hasn't been lending for, for a while. So I think that, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this is the reason why uh, a lot of local governments are, are distressed because uh, they don't get money uh, from property developers anymore. So mm-hmm. uh, it's been going on for over a year. But uh, the uh, uh, but in term, uh, uh, what's going on now is that uh, uh, how the losses are being realized. Okay, and I I always believe that the government will not bail out of the shadow banking system. They, they let it grow uh, precisely for their, for an outcome like that. Mm. They tighten up the lending uh, criteria for uh, the state-owned banks. Then the shadow banking system uh, rose about a decade ago, and it was it it happened by by for a reason. So that's why now what's going on now uh, is uh, is logical. 
Do you think Beijing, President Xi Jinping can keep their nerve? Because this um, could lead to some economic turmoil, couldn't it? Are they going to stick with their resolve of um, not providing money to you know, shadow banking uh, lenders, to property developers? Can they no, do that? No, absolutely not. They will let shadow banks all die. They will? I believe. Okay. Yeah, they will. Yeah, because the economy is... Uh, uh, you know, including all these shadow banks in Hong Kong, Hong Kong, much of the Hong Kong banking system, financial system, all these guys in Central are really shadow bankers. Mm. They're past, but I just they don't know. Uh, they don't want to recognize that. Mm. I think that the issue is that what happens to China after when these guys are gone. It's okay. They were pumping money into property, property uh, developers, and they, then they pumping into uh, local governments. And now a lot of local governments don't have money to spend. Uh, they just have to become smaller and smaller. The impact on ordinary people is limited. Mm. Mm. So do, do you think um, the medicine that, uh, that Beijing is, is dishing out, is that going to uh, be enough to sort of revive the economy this year? No, I think the economy will, uh, will be uh, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, in a tough situation for many years. Last year, uh, it grew by <coughs> a little bit over 5%. Uh, and a lot of people think that, that this year is going to be uh, better. I don't, I don't think so. I think that uh, uh, the, the reason is because the last year we got a low, low base bounce in both uh, domestic tourism and in, in, uh, in automobile. And uh, we're not going to see uh, uh, these two uh, uh, repeating performance. Mm. Uh, the export might improve a little bit because there was an inventory, inventory problem in the elect electronic sector last year. So, but I think 5% is going to be a struggle. Mm. The, the, the but China, the, the, the low growth is not in a, uh, uh, such a challenge anymore because the labor market, there's a structural labor shortage. The youth unemployment uh, problem is related to all these college graduates who don't want uh, uh, blue-collar jobs. Mm. <clears throat> and so they have to figure out what they want to do with their lives. And the economy cannot uh, provide so many uh, white-collar jobs no matter what. If you mm. create a bubble like in the internet sector or in the property sector, you might, might create some white-collar jobs, but uh, they're not sustainable. The, the government wants to put a lot of resources, doesn't it, into certain sectors that it sees as being a priority, like things like electric vehicles, solar panels, batteries, and the like. But is that going to be enough to sort of hold yeah. up the economy and also provide the jobs that, that are needed for, uh, for all these unemployed youth? Well, yeah, I, the issue is that the property sector deflating, the impact is more more. Uh, uh, is felt more imme immediately, uh, mm. <clears throat> and uh, the local government is getting cut off, uh, so they cannot spend like before. On the other side, is that the resources resources are being reallocated to uh, uh, more competitive industries, uh, like uh, like uh, what he mentioned, the solar and EV, but mm. uh, but. Uh, it it happens over time, so mm -hmm. uh, so you, you you cannot switch quickly, uh, and and the more uh, 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 kind of uh, you know, the the solu you you could do a demand side solution more quickly by uh, let's say uh, tax cards or some kind of a uh, 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 payment to the household sector like what happened in the United States, but the Chinese government wouldn't do that because the uh, it's a priority is uh, defined by this these, uh, rivalry with the U.S. or the U.S. containment, containment strategy. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it wants to pour resources into uh, technology independence. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that, that that's what uh, they are doing. But it's not, the, the demand impact is not, the, uh, it's not enough to offset what's going on in the property sector. And, and is this what President Xi Jinping means when he talks about high quality development? That's the phrase he's used many times now, including in his New Year speech where he set out uh, the economic goals for this year. Is, is that what he means by high quality development? I think high quality, yeah. yeah, yeah. One is uh, national, uh, national security uh, uh, trumps everything else. That's mm. uh, one, one layer of, of its meaning. The other is that, uh, that uh, uh, the government will not bail out the property uh, shadow banking sector. Mm. So all, uh, because that, uh, 
the government basically buckled every time uh, when the bubble uh, deflated, like in 2008 and a couple of times uh, uh, afterwards, because that uh, uh, the, you know the uh, the sector is so large, a lot of people over there inside have influence, especially shadow bankers. They have a lot of money. They don't have a whole lot of to to, to do. So and they have a big voice, and uh, so uh, the, you know, the, all these negative uh, uh, words you hear about. Uh, in terms of government, the policy towards the property sector usually come from those guys, and uh, and uh, and they still trying to uh, to get the government to do what uh, it did in two thousand eight, or, or the U.S. government did in two thousand eight. Basically, quantitative easing to bail these guys out. Uh, basically, Xi Jinping is saying that uh, it's not going to happen because his priority is uh, is really uh, related to the United States. So, so uh, you guys are not important anymore. So what's going to happen at the end of the year? Because it sounds like you, you're not overly optimistic that things are going to improve in just one year. It's going to take longer um, than that. If, if yeah. the economy is still uh, sluggish, is, is still struggling uh, to get over the problems in the property sector, recover from uh, the, the, the sort of economic measures that were going on during the pandemic, um, what, what next can the government do or w- would it do? No, I, I think the government will not do much. Basically, let it go. Really? So the economy is going to uh, slow, uh, grow relatively slowly. Mm. But uh, during the meantime, the resources are being reallocated to more competitive industries and new activities are going to happen, including uh, now, uh, now it's becoming well known, the EV sector. Uh, China is going to become uh, uh, the, the dominant uh, player in the global automobile sector. That's very important. Then we see solar, we see space, uh, and uh, uh, new materials, uh, uh, and a semiconductor, all these sectors are going to rise over time. Well, well the main impact, oh, of course, there will be a growth impact. Mm. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, in terms of e- uh, macroeconomic impact, it will force the government to let the currency approach, appreciate. So China will become a high-income economy, not because of a really very fast growth, because of a currency appreciation, just like what happened in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan. Mm. Ultimately, uh, you can, uh, will you become high-income uh, economy because that you are so competitive that your currency has to become more like a, a, a rich country's currency, basically strong. So the currency value will go up. But who's going to buy all these electric vehicles and that, that China produces because it doesn't have enough domestic demand uh, to absorb that itself, all this overcapacity. And right now, um, the, the EU, the US are just not willing um, to absorb all that excess capacity and see their trade uh, deficits with uh, with China surge even more? Well, I think the EU is not in a good position uh, really to... Uh, they, the EU is talking but not doing anything. If they do something to Chinese uh, 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 com- companies, China surely will retaliate by doing something to European automakers in China and they sell a whole lot more in China and make a whole lot of money. Uh, it's basically... It's a European auto sector survival depends on the Chinese market. So I, I don't think that Europe is in a position uh, to do much. I think the US will try to block China Chinese uh, uh, EVs, the current 25% tariff probably will be increased at some point because the U.S. auto sector is not viable. It hasn't been viable for a long, long time. So, mm-hmm. uh, so But uh, the U.S. is only 15 uh, million units. Uh, the global uh, uh, size is now 80 million. Uh, and Chinese uh, uh, EVs will become much cheaper over time. And also, the, uh, a big advantage of EVs is that its operating cost is very low. The fuel cost is now it's one kilowatt hour go, goes uh, five kilometers, and uh, that uh, range it only goes up depending on how much the oil price is or what electricity price is at where you are. Uh, the, the the advantage is huge in China now is five to one, and in Europe uh, it's uh, uh, it's it's less than that, but it's still a big advantage. In the United States, not much, uh, not not so much, because the uh, the uh, the, uh, the oil prices, uh, the gasoline prices low, and the, and all uh, uh, and the electricity prices high. So it depends on where you are. But for emerging economies, like the global South, uh, they are going to be like China. The uh, the EV will have huge operating uh, advantage. So um, as the price of an EV comes down, more and more people will be able to afford. 
uh, uh, cars. So the whole market will grow above uh, uh, 100 million units before 2030. So Chinese uh, uh, companies could, by 2030, sell like uh, uh, 20 million cars outside of China, and the Chinese market is uh, is 30 million, will become largely Chinese. Mm. So eventually, China will will account for over half of the global auto sector. Well. Wow. Very interesting. Andy, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed once again and have a great week and a happy new year. That's Shanghai-based independence economist Andy Sher. You're listening to Peter Lewis's Money Talk. Money Talk.